Now I'm going to try to send this ball into space. Oh, gravity, you heartless... Okay, let me try to apply a bit more force. Well, jokes aside, it shouldn't be surprising that the more force I apply, the farther the ball flies. But then it eventually falls down to the ground. And also, it's not a secret that in theory, I could throw it hard enough to give the ball enough velocity so it would never fall back and enter the orbit around Earth. The escape velocity, or this trajectory. By the way, did you notice that here we see not a rocket, but a cannon? The idea of launching an object into space using a gun is actually pretty old. Jules Verne in the 19th century wrote in his novel From the Earth to the Moon about launching humans to the moon by the means of a huge cannon. So perhaps it's uh, not a such a bad idea. In my demonstration with the ball, the problem was not the ball, but rather my weak arms. If I was replaced with a huge powerful cannon, could we launch an object into space? Actually, yes, we could, and it has already been done. Today I'd like to talk not only about space cannons, but actually about three different non-rocket space launch technologies. Besides cannons that also can be of different kinds, we are going to talk about the Star Tram technology and the Lovestrom loop. All of them have something in common, and at the same time, something drastically different. So let's talk about all this. My name is Andre. And this is Cosmos Elementary. Firstly, if this idea is so old, why is no one actively using it today? There are reasons for that, but still there were several attempts at non-rocket space launch technologies and it's not completely abandoned. The first obvious advantage of, well, shooting something into space is that a spacecraft wouldn't need to carry that much fuel. As we know, currently the most of the rocket's mass is fuel, and that is one of the factors that make space launches so expensive. So in theory, non-rocket launches could be way cheaper. Let's begin with space cannons in a more classical sense. I've mentioned that people already launched something into space this way. I'm talking about the HARP project, not the HARP. HARP is a different project of ionospheric research and there are a lot of conspiracy theories about it. Claims that it can control weather and even people's minds. That's a completely different story, but I might make a video on it. So HARP with a single A is High Altitude Research Project, US Canadian project from the 60s of the last century. The goal of the project was to study upper layers of the atmosphere, atmospheric country, and yes, the possibility to launch satellites using a cannon. A giant cannon that would use expanding gas to shoot out a projectile. That is one of the actual cannons in Barbados that is now abandoned. The maximum height that 180 kg projectiles reached during tests was 180 kilometers, or about 111 miles, which is significantly higher than Kármán line, which is usually referred to as a edge of space. That is of course not exactly the case, but in some cases it is recognized this way. Also, the harp projectiles reached higher than tourist flights of Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. So the cannon did actually launch an object into space. But what kind of g-force was the object subjected to? 5 g's? Maybe 10 g's? Hmm. 25,000 Gs. So you probably don't want to put a human into such a cannon. The projectiles then fell back to the ground, or more precisely, to the ocean, and not a single one was actually put into orbit. Although there were some projects of vehicles with multiple stages that could actually put a spacecraft into orbit, but that didn't happen and the HARP project was closed. That was not the end of the story. In the beginning of the 80s there was a similar project, SHARP, which is just super HARP. It was also funded by the government, but this time it didn't even come to the full-scale tests. And of course, those were not the only attempts to create a space cannon. More recent one is Quick Launch. In a way, it is following in the footsteps of SHARP and it was created by the same key people who worked on SHARP. The difference is that it was a private company. But they plan to scale it way up. If in the cases I had mentioned before, the length of cannons was in tens of meters, but in this project it had to be over a kilometer long or closer to a mile. Another big difference is that this light gas gun was supposed to be constructed not on land but in the ocean. When the shot is made, the projectile escapes the gun and gets rid of the outer shell. Then at the altitude of 100 kilometers, another shell that protects the spacecraft from the atmosphere gets dropped. 
At the altitude of 450 km, it fires rocket engines to achieve a desired orbit, so in theory you could launch satellites this way, or else deliver fuel to propellant depots in orbit. The whole thing obviously wouldn't be cheap, but the people behind the project estimated that it could eventually bring the cost of launching 1 kg into orbit down to $550. Would we be able to send people into space this way? Well, the G-force would be about 5000 Gs. And John Hunter, one of the key people at Quick Launch, said that people, quote, would probably get compressed to half their size, unquote. That would cause instant death. So, yeah. And what is this company up to now? There was some activity in 2010, but now the official website can only be accessed in the web archives. And here is a quote from John Hunter. For now, with the work Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX, there is no room for a project like Quick Launch. So for now, the idea of using a light gas gun to launch satellites into orbit has not been implemented. But there is something better. Cannons, explosions, expanding gas, okay boomer. How about some magnetic levitation? So, Star Tram. Actually, you probably wouldn't surprise anyone with magnetic levitation today. Cheap souvenirs, actual working trains that use magnetic levitation or maglev for short. One of the inventors of superconducting maglev train technology, James Powell, together with George Mays, came up with the concept of Star Tram, which is using maglev train technology to launch objects into space. Here, comparing to the previous projects, the scale is even more epic. Modern maglev trains use electromagnets, some of them to make a train levitate above the track, others for stabilization, basically not to let it wobble and constantly hit the walls, and of course magnets for acceleration. They can be placed on the sides of the track, and the polarity of those magnets gets constantly switched, and that makes the train accelerate. The higher the frequency of that switching, the faster the train goes. The speed of the superconducting maglev train in Japan is more than 600 km per hour, or about 373 miles per hour. And that's not the limit. You could go even faster, but the problem is that air resistance increases drastically as well as the energy consumption, so after a certain point, it becomes very inefficient to go faster. So in some ways, Star Tram is similar to maglev trains. No friction with the track and acceleration with electromagnets. But to actually launch a spacecraft this way, you would need a way higher velocities. That's why Star Tram was supposed to accelerate in vacuum tube. That's an image from the paper by authors of the Star Tram concept. On the ground, there is a vacuum tunnel where the tram accelerates just like a maglev train, but with no air resistance, which allows it to achieve way higher speed. But it has to leave the tunnel at some point, right? That's why the tube starts to go up. The idea is to rise the tunnel above the densest layer of the atmosphere. If a spacecraft at speeds necessary to reach orbit suddenly turned out in the conditions of regular atmospheric pressure, it would disintegrate. But at a height of 10 km or more, the atmospheric pressure is just a fraction of that at the sea level. There were two proposed versions of this type of launch. The high G-force one of about 30 Gs to launch only cargo. In this case, the launch tube could be built on a mountain. Sending humans to space this way needed a bit different approach with G-force of only 2.5 Gs and with more gradual altitude increase and also higher altitude of about 20 kilometers and we don't have any mountains on Earth that tall. Building a structure 1600 kilometers or a thousand miles long that goes up to 20 kilometers, that doesn't sound very realistic. That's why they suggested a different approach, which, to be honest, doesn't sound any less crazy. Lifting the tube up using magnetic levitation. Here is another image, so there are huge superconducting cables on the ground and a launch tube with another superconducting cable levitates above those ground cables and the tube is held in place with vertical feathers and angled feathers. At the end, the launch tube is not sealed, but it's not a big deal at that altitude and density. And also, the pumps would compensate for any leakage that does occur. After escaping the tube, it would turn on regular chemical engines to reach the final orbit. Again, that in theory could reduce the cost of space launches. It's even in the name of the paper. Star Tram. An ultra-low cost launch system. Building that thing wouldn't be cheap. The cost was estimated to be around 20 billion dollars for cargo launches and 60 to 70 billion to launch humans into orbit. 
But according to the authors of the concept, if StarTram could launch about 100,000 tons into space, it could bring the cost of one kilogram down to only $30. So they had estimated that the cargo only StarTram could have begun operations by um, 2020. But as we can see, no star trams around. I haven't found any information about current active development of this concept, which is not very surprising. But actually, there are concepts of even larger scale. A structure of 20 kilometers high? Hold my soda, said the Lofström loop. The launch loop, also known as Lofström loop, named after the author of the idea, at the first glance might look similar to the concept of the star tram. A vacuum tube, very long and tall structure, use of electromagnets, that's where similarities end. Lofström loop would be a huge structure 2000 kilometers long that goes up not 20, but 80 kilometers up. So the acceleration part would almost be in space already. In images like this one, the thickness of the structure elements is exaggerated to actually be able to see them. The obvious question is, how that thing is supposed to be lifted up that high? No, this time it's not magnetic levitation. The idea belongs to Keith Lofstrom. In his article where he describes the technology, he uses a water analogy. Take a hose and leave it on the ground, then let a strong stream of water run in it. It is easy to picture how it would start wiggling and even at some point raise above the ground. And now imagine, we don't just drop this hose into the ground and let it move as it pleases to, but we fix it in a certain position with some ropes. We could do it in a way so the hose would form an arc. The water hitting the hose inside acts against gravitational attraction of the Earth. Lofström loop works in a similar fashion, but instead of water, it uses a so-called rotor. A long segmented metal cable with a diameter of only 5 cm or a couple of inches, and that's what its cross-section looks like. So the vacuum tube is the hose in our analogy. And here is the rotor. The rotor doesn't touch the tube because it levitates magnetically and electromagnets make it move. It accelerates to a very high speed of about 14 km per second and the rotor is a loop. Even though there is no direct contact, as it is the case with the hose and water, rotor affects the tube magnetically and it makes the whole structure go up. And a system of stabilizing cables makes the structure, well, stable. We could also compare the rotor with a cowboy lasso, but if it also were in a shell of sorts. Here is a very simple depiction of that. Here are electromagnets that set the rotor in motion, and you can see the loop itself. There are two parallel tubes where rotor moves in opposite directions. At the beginning of the straight part of the loop, at the altitude of 80 kilometers, there are platforms, from which the spacecraft is launched. And also there are elevators that goes up to those platforms. The obvious advantage of such an altitude is almost lacking a resistance, and at the same time it's not tall enough for flying satellites to be a problem. Along the rotor there are electromagnetic tracks. Special capsules are placed on tracks similar to maglev trains, and they are accelerated with the rotor. The g-force is about 3 g's, which is fine for humans. After reaching required velocity, the capsule lifts the track and it can also turn on rocket engines to reach the final orbit. Before the beginning of operation, the rotor and the structure is on the surface, and while the rotor spins up, it gradually rises above the Earth and takes the final shape. To keep the structure steady, the rotor needs to be constantly rotating, so it always needs energy input. Obviously, such a structure would have a lot of kinetic energy. In the case of a failure, it could cause energy outbursts comparable with the nuclear explosion. We can't completely eliminate the possibility of catastrophic failure, so there has to be some safety measures. Firstly, it has to be far from populated areas, ideally in the ocean and hopefully farther from busy ship routes. The most effective locations for the loop are along the equator. Here they are shown in yellow. Also, the loop has to have all the necessary sensors and detectors to, well, detect the problem, and it has to be able to ditch the rotor, not to let it destroy the whole structure. It was thought to be capable of not only launching satellites, but even spacecraft to the moon. Lofstrom wrote that one loop could launch into orbit 80 spacecraft. Not a month, not a day, but an hour. According to Lofstrom, at an initial cost of 10 billion, the system could eventually reduce the price of sending one kilogram into orbit to just three dollars. The idea is quite interesting, too bad no one seems to be working on it so far. 
Obviously, it won't be easy to actually realize such a project, but it's not impossible. It involves principles or technologies that are either known or already in use in some form. It's not surprising that such projects and ideas even occurred. Many people believe that classical chemical rockets are simply not enough for future space exploration. We need alternative and cheaper methods to put things and people into space. It doesn't have to be specifically the projects I talked about, it could be something completely new. Time will tell. Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are down below in the description. And if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye.